Yeah, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. We're now entering conversations about health and COVID-19 updates. 13 core members in Cross River State have tested positive to the coronavirus. As of Sunday, January 24th, the total number of confirmed cases in Cross River is 189. The Commissioner for Health in Cross River State, Beta Edu, said the recent high cases is because of core members who came in to the state for the National Youth Service Corps program, NYC. And who called on the federal government to help Cross River States fix their labs so they can scale up COVID-19 testing. Uh, meanwhile, the Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19 on Monday announced the extension of Phase 3 of the ease lockdown by one month. Also, it's been discovered that there's a new COVID-19 strain uh, that was discovered in the UK. It's now in Nigeria, and that's according to the Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19 in Lagos. Uh, we have joining us Dr. Titsi Olubade. She is an, a public health physician and an epidemiologist. Good morning, and thanks for joining us, Dr. Titsi. Good morning. Yes, first of all... Good how, morning, dear. Yes, good morning. Thanks for joining us. I was going to ask you, first of all, that this pandemic started, you know, first case recorded in China, December 31st, 2019. It's been over a year now. In your experience as a public health physician, did you expect this pandemic to go on for this long and this bad? Well, so that's the thing about um, pandemics and outbreaks. They are totally unpredictable. And um, the truth is, I had actually, you know, expected that the pandemic would be over by now. But if we look at the trend across um, all the countries, especially where there were a high number of cases, at the time there was... Um, the ease of lockdown and people went on with um, social behaviors uh, that would um, continue the spread and transmission of the virus, the pandemic continued and not just even continued, but second waves started um, springing up across different uh, countries, necessitating um, another set of lockdowns in the US, in some parts of Europe, and um, in the UK, there have been repeated lockdowns in order to um, stem the tide of this pandemic and um, flatten the curve. In Africa, the story is, is also the same. Um, we're hoping that by towards the end of last year, according to the different mathematical modelings and epidemiological projections, that the pandemic would have been over towards the end of last year, but somehow the the variant, the SARS-CoV-2 variant that is currently in circulation in the UK was found to have, you know, found its way into South Africa and also Nigeria. And this has also increased the number of cases this time around with even more virulence. And this virulence is not sparing any age demographic. And that's why we're seeing um, cases in the, in the coppers, that have um, gone to NYC camps, not even just in um, Cross River State, but across the country. So this is a very worrisome situation. And uh, the truth is that as long as we continue to treat, we'll continue to find cases. And for these core members, they're coming from different parts of the country. We do not know who they've interacted with. We do not know the level of exposure. But for the fact that they've tested positive, they need to be treated, and it also tells us that we need to be more careful. Mm. All right. Um, if we're talking about more careful, that might be a little difficult, you know, because of the peculiarities of our situation here in Nigeria. Um, but, you know, what would you, you know, expect that the government maybe would have done different with being able to handle uh, this second wave? Um, Lagos State is having staggering figures every day um, of um, positive cases. And so, you know, what, what would your recommendations have been in order for us to reduce the, the um, numbers that we have across the country this morning, uh, seeing how dangerous the second wave is? Yes, this, this second wave has been very, very aggressive. 
and it has even been worse in um, older persons, people under, I mean, people above 60, and people with underlying medical conditions. Another challenge is that even in people, apparently healthy persons that didn't have any um, ongoing um, illness, they've still had very virulent forms, aggressive forms of the illness, and you know this has increased both morbidity and mortality of the COVID-19 cases in Nigeria. So the truth is that government has actually been quite proactive. Um, there have been advisories released over different intervals. The um, public health agencies, the NCDC, the Ministry of Health, the Presidential Task Force has, you know, been very communicative with Nigerians. There's been a lot of advocacy, community engagement, social mobilization, health education. This would definitely still have to continue more intensively, okay? However, it's also important right now that the country, um, especially at the government's level, they find a way to trace and track travelers and find those that have not complied with the testing directives and ensure that those are coming to the country self-isolate. Because at the point when this case started increasing towards the middle of last year, I mean, towards the end of last year, from the November to December um, time interval, when a lot of people were coming to the country, a lot of persons that returned to Nigeria from um, abroad did not self-isolate. These people were going to parties, social events, large gatherings, and that fostered the spread of the virus. So there should be a system in place to trace, track, and identify defaulters, and then get these people. But, but, to but this may not be very easy. Oh, so. If, if I, I don't know if you agree that this may not be very easy. Um, I remember what we did during the Ebola if, during the Ebola crisis. Might, might be a little might be a little different. Uh, the approach then was a little yes. different. Uh, but, you know, do you, how possible it, it, it is, is, is it easy. really? It might not be easy, but I believe that it is possible, okay? Because in other climes, in other settings, even in low- and middle-income countries, they found a way around this, okay? There's no way you'll be coming into a country and you would not be tested and you will not be, and you will not self-isolate. So this is why it's important to involve technology in our outbreak responses and our pandemic response, okay? Because now it's COVID-19. We don't know what it's going to be in another six months, another one year, another five years. So we must always be prepared for the next, next epidemic. So it's very important now that technology is incorporated into our response. And also um, identity management, do we have data that helps us to identify all Nigerians coming in and out of the country? Do we have data that helps us to locate where persons who have returned into the country are? Do we know how to trace and track people who have any time gone under the radar? So it's very important that we incorporate technology into our healthcare systems because Indeed. this is one of the ways that we'll be able to, you know... Um, all right. Hmm. Uh, up our interventions. Hmm. Also, you... another thing I think Sorry, the ahead. government yes. should also consider is the overwhelming evidence about um, new drug interventions that can um, help with prophylaxis and treatment. Now, these drugs are not new, so to speak. They've always been um, on our essential drug list, but more and more evidence is available to help us see that these drugs might be very useful in prevention and treatment of COVID-19. So I think it's also important now for the governments to work with the academia, to work with research teams across the country that have been, that have been incorporated into the um, response to look at this evidence and see if while waiting for vaccines, we can deploy this um, medication at a, at a country level, and then see how it goes and improves the lives of Nigerians. Um, doctor, I'm really happy you mentioned this because the University of Joss, you know, got a grant from the World Bank and at its institution for the African Center for Excellence in Phytomedicine Research and Development. They, they you know, 
researched and came up with this herbal tea to, uh, you know, to be used to treat COVID-19. But then on social media, we found fake news, so to speak, that the VC of the university you know, has now debunked. You know, news saying that uh, the medicine doesn't work and NAVDAC has banned it. But we know that this is fake news because the VC said, said so. So how would you uh, say inf misinformation? Basically, conspiracy theories, misinformation are affecting how Nigerians perceive locally produced vaccines or treatments for the virus. And do they really work? Let, let's talk about yeah. misinformation because <laughs> I think our mindset is the first thing. If you're already mm -hmm. predisposed or you already have that mindset that it doesn't work, I think that's where we need to start from the mindset yeah. before you know the actual thing. So, but, doctor, what's your what's your thoughts on this? All right, so misinformation in itself it is another is another pandemic. Okay, so the you know in the um, scientific community it's been termed as infodemic, and we've seen that um, misinformation can drive anxiety, it can drive confusion, it can drive you know um, mistrust, you know at different levels. So it's very important that um, at the onset, even prior to um, an outbreak or a pandemic, once you are getting, when, when a country or a nation is getting feelings that there is um, an unusual event or a suspicious event that can threaten the life or livelihoods or even economy of a country, they start sharing correct information about such a situation with their citizens so that even if that situation should occur in that country, the citizenry is, also, is already informed and then they can take necessary precautions to stay safe and to stay healthy, all right? Okay. So misinformation has driven, you know, confusion and a lot of mistrust, you know, globally. And in Nigeria in particular, we are not exempt from that. Now, the use of herbal therapies, um, herbal medications, is subject to what is called clinical trial. It's subject to testing and it's subject to um, validation. So the challenge is that a lot of um, claims about one herbal preparation or one other drug or the other is that there's no evidence to show that these things work. But if, you know, a scientist or a researcher or someone that has, you know, insight into the efficacy or effectiveness of a drug comes and says, oh, my drug works, you know, everybody will ask you, where is the evidence? Where is your data? Was, what clinical trial did you do? What, um, in which population did you test? And so when this um, evidence is available, then you can now um, leave it open for you know, scrutiny. And that is what has been done for all the medications that we use now. These processes were, were, were thoroughly followed, even for vaccines. Okay, so it is not that locally produced or manufactured drugs don't work. But the challenge is that a lot of the researchers and scientists that, um, or herbal practitioners that bring forward their claims do not substantiate it with evidence. So, so in many countries, their herbal preparations have even been scaled up to global use. The current um, anti-malarial combination that we use now, the artemisinin-based combination therapy, was derived from um, the artemisia plants. But it was shown with evidence that this medication works for malaria. So we need so, to show our work. Yeah, in. you know, and, and whose responsibility? Yeah, uh, sorry, um, so we Doc. can do the same as well. Yeah, I, I just want to know whose responsibility should it be then to assist uh, some of these herbal um, uh, practitioners uh, to do proper research and understand the power in their own medication and in their own discoveries. Uh, because, um, and I, I also want you to share with us, you know, in, in the course of you handling, I believe, COVID-19 patients and stories that you've also heard, I'm sure that there's also some local remedies that maybe have assisted some patients get better. Um, I know a few people who have done the steam inhalation, you know, with garlic and some other things. Um, some people have mentioned Agbo. I, I don't know how, how that works. Even though they've um, been, they've, you know, you've had... Organizations like the World Health Organization saying they don't work. Let's yeah, put that but, out there. But it, it has, I, I believe it has helped some people here. So whose responsibility should it be to do proper research on which of these things here and there might be helpful at some stage? 
And why aren't we taking all, all of these serious? We, we seem to always knock off herbal medicine immediately that conversation comes up. Okay, so um, the truth is that it is the responsibility of every researcher and scientist to find out the in-country guidelines for whatever products or mixture or therapy that they have um, developed, okay? And then you have, um, for, for research to work, for research to be outstanding, many times you need collaborators and you also need funding, okay? So if a scientist has a therapy that he or she has developed, it is important that he collaborates from, with, um, collaborates with different stakeholders from um, the different, um, you know, medical or research institutes across the country, and then they form a team, and then they apply for maybe a license or um, something that has to do with analyzing their the content of their therapy. From I think there's a Nigerian Institute of um, Med Nigerian Institute All of right. Medical Research, and also the pharmaceutical. There's also a pharmaceutical um, research institute. Yeah, there's a Nigerian pharmaceutical research institute that is a subsidiary of the Federal Ministry of Health. So these two institutions are the ones that verify and validate such claims. So it is important for researchers who have developed drugs or therapies to approach them so that their work can be validated. Hmm. Okay, so, and what the notion I also want to correct is that um, herbal medication or herbal mixtures or herbal therapies are not discarded. A lot of... Um, medication they use in the country have actually been validated from these two research institutes and they are currently in use. Okay. The most important thing is that they are found to be safe and there's evidence that they work. Once this is available, nothing is thrown out. And for most of the things I have mentioned, people have mentioned things like garlic, ginger, turmeric, they are even natural foods that we eat in our regular diet. So food fruits, fluids, stimulant inhalation, they have their place as supportive therapy in the management of COVID-19 and even other illnesses. All right. Okay, but they are not the definitive treatments. They are okay. just supportive treatments. So there's, there's a buzz right now regarding COVID-19 testing. You check on social media and you see lots of people complaining about how, you know, they pay for the tests in Nigeria, the tests never get done, but they go to other countries and, you know, right there at the airport, they do the rapid test, they get their results and they fly out. So why do we have these issues in Nigeria? First of all, there's the issue of exploitation of Nigerians who want to travel by, you know, these laboratories. And then there's the issue of, you know, the test never even get, getting done in the first place. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so my thoughts on that is that this is also part of where the government needs to take 100% responsibility. Because testing is at the core of the, um, of the pandemic and the outbreak response. Okay? Because the laboratory components of any outbreak response is key to defining um, who is maybe a suspected case or a confirmed case, and then the plans for such a person, whether the person is isolating or is on quarantine or starts getting treatment immediately. So the laboratory component is a very key, has a very key role in, an out, in outbreak detection and response. And it's also one of the basis for what we call the case definitions. Okay. So I think the government needs to take responsibility about this. At this point in time, by now, I was expecting that the test, there will be a testing center at all the international airports in the country because the, the testing can be made mobile, okay? So it's not something that has to be in a particular fixed location. There are mobile labs across the country, across different states. So a mobile lab too can be put in the airport so that it will reduce the um, the people going under the radar who don't get tested before they go back into the community. Yes, and even it will do have... relieve the stress. It will relieve the stress of moving from maybe the airport to the, the testing center and then back to the airport. For someone right. who just traveled, there's jet lag, True. there's person is already tired and then you still expect the person to be going around 
Lagos or any other states start doing testing. So these are how we miss out on people that probably are even asymptomatic but are positive and they're going to the community and keep That's spreading right, the virus. That's right, Dr. Could so you I just can you hold on? Hold on for us a minute, please. Um, we know right now that we have the Commissioner for Health in Cross River State, uh, Better edu uh, with us uh, to basically discuss the issue of the COVID-19 pandemic in the States. Good morning and thanks for joining us, Pa. Good morning. Yeah, we're aware about the cases, the rising cases of COVID-19 in Cross River and how you've mentioned that is because, you know, NYC core members are coming into the state and, you know, they're now getting tested for the virus. Is that what the case is, really? So, we didn't say the rising cases is because NYC members are coming into the state and they're being tested. We only said that the numbers which was shown as the 20 cases, 13 of them, are from the NYC camp in Obuja, while the remaining seven are from the general population. That's what we said. So it's not just about the NYC coming into the state. Um, COVID-19 is everywhere now, and we'll probably find even more cases um, after we activate um, the laboratory which was destroyed by the NSAS protest and we can restart the community testing um, for COVID-19 in the state. So once we get that started, then we should even be able to see even more than 20 cases um, in a day because of course you know at this point in time that there is community spread of the COVID-19 virus. All right, uh, quickly share with us how um, the 13 cases so far and the extra seven you mentioned are being um, monitored and handled. Uh, is it, you know, a possibility that these, you know, persons were you know, likely also able to spread it to other people in the state? Um, you know, how exactly is the um, health uh, yes. ministry are they currently in, uh, in isolation? Pro state? Yes. Exactly. How are they handling these persons um, and um, what next uh, should be done? So they're actually currently in isolation. They're in isolation presently. Um, those at the camp are in Obubra in isolation. And then we have um, four persons who are on isolation in Calabar. And then the rest of them are managed from home because they meet the home management criteria by the case management team. So um, that's what's going on presently. And that's just to ensure that uh, we prevent the spread of the disease from one person to the other. But like I said, um, following the NTAS protest in um, October, we had some setbacks. So the reference lab in Calabar was destroyed. The 100 bed isolation center was destroyed. And several um, other challenges that happened um, with the NSAS process. But we're happy that NCDC is working with us. In fact, as of yesterday, they had just sent the equipment from Abuja and it should be arriving in Calabar. If it didn't arrive at night, then it would arrive early this morning. Um, so we can reset up, restart the PTR lab. That lab would help us to do massive testing. And of course, we'll be able to know the true picture of what is going on in the communities. Remember, this lab works 24 hours, um, seven days a week. And the state pays the health workers working there um, incentives to keep them working around the clock in their various um, calls. So really, really, these people are being cared for right now as we speak, and they are following all the COVID-19 protocols and the guidelines for case identification and case management as given to the states by um, the NCDC. So this is on our EOC, and I'm just reading directly from our EOC this morning. Okay, uh, is there um, also a, a makeshift uh, isolation center that has been set up? The NSAS protest happened in October last year. Uh, we're almost in February now. So is there currently a, another isolation center that has, so has been fully... So that's not the only isolation center we had in the state, right? Okay. So this was one isolation center that was 100 beds. The one in the UTTA, that the University of Calabar Teaching Hospital, was a five-bed isolation center, and it's still there and it's still functional. Those who are in Calabar are actually in that center right now. We had to make a center in Obubra General Hospital, which did not exist before, just for proximity to the NYC camp. Remember that we've had three badges of NYC. The first badge had, um, I think, two cases. The second badge had 11 cases. And then we also have the third badge that is ongoing now. 
right? And then we now have another isolation center at the northern part of the state, which was not affected by the NSAS, which is at the General Hospital, Ogoja. So this, and it has a 10 bed space. So these are various isolation centers that were not affected. Unfortunately, the one with the largest capacity, which was the 100 bed for both male and female, was what was affected during the NSAS um, protest in um, October. Hmm. Dr. Titi Olubwade, we'll be coming to you in just a moment, but uh, this, this still goes to uh, better edu. We know that Crush River State seems to have handled the COVID-19 quite well, and uh, we just want to find out what are the challenges you, you're encountering right now that would say is impeding you know, the, the success so far, the handling of the case in Cross River State? I think the biggest um, factor at this point, right, is um, the testing. Yeah, that's the biggest challenge. And it's not just a cross river state challenge. It's a national challenge, right? At this point in time, we should have labs in every single state, reference lab, molecular labs, that can test not just for COVID, but can test for TB, HIV, and any other disease that might come in future. COVID is not the first and it's not the last, right? So as a country, we should use this window of opportunity to prepare. There could be another pandemic. There could be another epidemic. There could be another outbreak. Remember last year, I think around August, September, we had issues from states like Delta and the rest of it. It took a while for them to understand that we were dealing with yellow fever that was killing people in their, in their thousands or in their hundreds, right? So we need to be able to prepare for future times, right? So testing is number one of the challenge, and we're happy that NCDC is working with the state to see how we can solve this. Another very pressing issue, right, is the logistics, the cold chain system. Remember, we're expecting the COVID-19 vaccines into the country. Apart from the one which was shown in Abuja, which was just recently built, that can be able to keep this vaccine in a potent state, which is very, very sensitive, uh, minus 80 to minus 60, um, I've heard uh, some arguments that the vaccine can be at minus 8 and minus 2 and it will still be viable. That's not right. That's not true. The manufacturer has clearly stated this is the um, temperature at which the vaccine will remain at optimal state. You don't want to be giving children in Nigeria plus votes in the name of vaccines. Go around the state. Do we have a replication of the same structure in those states? Do we have a logistic means to transport the vaccine? These are all challenges that are right. facing the COVID-19 response in Cross River and all across the country. Unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. Um, there's a lot more that I wish that we, would, uh, we were able to share with regards Cross River State and its handling of the, of the uh, pandemic. Uh, we wish, of course, uh, we hope that you uh, would continue to do all that is necessary to ensure that the state is safe and um, the state generally is able to handle the pandemic um, in its entirety. Thank you very much for stopping by, uh, Mrs. Uh, Beta Edu. Uh, thanks for your thank time. You. Dr. Titi Ulubade, thank you also for your time. Thanks for discussing with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Do have Absolutely. a good day. You too. All right, um, that's all we have uh, with regards um, COVID-19. COVID we are yes. going to be talking next about Biden, Biden. Trump and policies.